Welcome everyone to Johns Hopkins SAIS. Uh, we have a terrific uh, event today uh, explaining the energy mix in China's electricity projects under Belt and Road. I'm really uh, excited to be able to address a topic that is uh, timely given some of China's recent announcements about its BRI energy investments uh, and also features some uh, new uh, work in progress, uh, research in progress that uh, I think raises some uh, important uh, questions, it provides some uh, preliminary uh, hypotheses and answers about the nature of China's energy investments. Uh, we're, we are very glad that you are uh, with us today. This event is also being uh, recorded and will be on, on YouTube later. Uh, and I'm very pleased to, uh, to introduce the panelists for today's uh, event. Uh, we're going to be hearing uh, first from uh, Dr. Chuyu Liu, who is Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Amsterdam. So you can wish him a good evening. Uh, he was a former postdoctoral fellow uh, at Johns Hopkins Science uh, and holds a PhD in political science from uh, Pennsylvania State University. Uh, he'll be presenting the, uh, the research, uh, um, and then uh, following that, one of his uh, research colleagues, uh, Sice's own uh, Professor Johannes Erpelainen, will be providing some uh, additional comments and framing for this research. Uh, Professor Erpelainen uh, is the director uh, and uh, Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz Professor of Energy Resources and Environment at Sice and the founding director of the Initiative for Sustainable uh, uh, Energy Policy, which is co-sponsoring this event. Uh, and he is a uh, whirlwind of energy um, in a personal sense and a research sense, uh, and has been doing, uh, leading a, a really interesting portfolio of research um, at SICE on sustainable energy. Um, our third uh, panelist, um, uh, Dr. Zehra Wahid is going to be providing some comments on this research uh, from a Pakistani perspective uh, and also um, uh, drawing on her own um, experience. She is assistant professor at the Suleiman Dawood School of Business at the uh, Lahore University of Management Sciences, LUMS, which is uh, uh, perhaps Pakistan's uh, leading private university and one with uh, with which Johns Hopkins has uh, a longstanding relationship. Uh, she holds an MBA in finance from the Institute of Business Administration in Karachi, uh, leading um, business school in Pakistan, um, and a, a master's in construction project management and a PhD from uh, Harriet Watt University in Scotland. Uh, so delighted to have her join uh, this evening from Pakistan and to hear her perspectives. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Liu um, to present this research. We will have some time for Q&A, so think of your questions, uh, put them into the Q&A uh, chat box uh, so that we will be ready to address them when the time comes. Um, over to you, Dr. Liu. Uh, thank you so much, Josh, for the kind introduction. And uh, now I want to share my screen. Could you could you see it? Indeed. Okay. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Um. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, to participate in this event. So today I'd like to present the research, which is co-authored with uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Hill and uh, Dr. Johannes Ubnani which is about the energy mix in China's electricity project on the Belt and Road Initiative. So let's start by looking at the motivation of the reason why we uh, do this study. So as you might notice with the recent expansion of the Chinese uh, overseas investment, this issue become a very salient topic among both the policy makers and the academia. And here is a map shows the ex external debt to China according to the recent research by the economist. So as you can see from this map, we show basically the percentage of the, uh, in, in terms of the, the, the external debt to China as a ratio to the domestic GDP of the recipient countries. 
and a lot of like African countries, countries in Central Asia, countries in Southeast Asia, they receive a lot of investment from China. And among these, among these, uh, these in, uh, investment projects, a lot of these projects are in the sector of the infrastructures. So let's just focus on a specific uh, industry, which is the energy industry. And here is the uh, figures which is taken from the recent report by the World Resources Institute, which shows within these energy sectors, if you look at the loans provided by Chinese policy banks, which are the major sponsors of the Chinese overseas uh, projects. And you can see that the electricity projects account for a substantial part of the Chinese overseas energy projects. So in addition to this very significant share of the electricity investment in the BI countries, given these investments also tend to be carbon intensive, especially with uh, like a lot of these Chinese electricity projects are for the coal-fired power plants. This also have huge implications for the, the important issues like global climate change. So that's the reason we focus on these research topics. We're looking at the Chinese overseas electricity investment, given it's like, it's like substantial importance in terms of the Chinese BRI investment and also in terms of its environmental implication for global climate changes. So when we do our study, we focus on two specific BI countries as our cases in point. So we're looking, so what we'll do in our study is we look at Pakistan and Indonesia as our two cases. The reason we make this, this case selection is because along with Brazil, Pakistan and Indonesia are among the top three countries in terms of receiving Chinese overseas electricity investment. So this figure is basically taken from the recent study done by Boston University's Global Development Policy Center, which looks at the China's global power data. And so Pakistan and Indonesia are quite important in terms of the size of the Chinese investment. And also we look at the two countries because the two countries share a lot of similarities. So for example, the first is both Pakistan and Indonesia, they are in Asia, which is different from Brazil, which is in Latin America. So second, both Pakistan and Indonesia, they share similar culture because a majority of the local population of the two countries, they are Muslims. And third, both Pakistan and Indonesia share a lot of institutional features. So for example, both they have the, they have the same regime type and they have, tend to have similar central local relations with significant decentralization of the power or decision-making power to local governments. So these countries share a lot of similarities but the puzzle we try to address or we want to focus on in our research is that there are also considerable difference between the two countries with regard to Chinese overseas electricity investment. So the first difference or the first puzzle we try to look at in our research is why do Chinese actors involved in solar and the wind sectors in Pakistan but not in Indonesia? And the second puzzle, so the first puzzle is basically about the investment re in renewable energy sectors. And the second puzzle is we're looking at the cross-country difference within the coal-fired power plants. So the question of the puzzle is why are Chinese-backed coal-fired power plants tend to be cleaner in Pakistan compared to the case of Indonesia? So the first question is about renewable energy. The second question is about coal power. And we see cross-country difference for these two different types of uh, energy sources. Now let's look at these two puzzles in more details using the data we collected. So the first puzzle 
is about the cross-country difference with regard to renewable energy investment. So if you look at the left side of the picture, which shows that most of, so the two pictures show the uh, portfolio of Chinese electricity investment. So if you look at the left side of the picture, which looking at the Chinese electricity investment in Indonesia, a majority overwhelmingly these investments are concentrated in the coal-fired power plants. Instead, if you're looking at the right side of the picture, which is the portfolio of the Chinese electricity investment in Pakistan, it tend to be more device, diverse, tend to be more diverse compared to that of Indonesia. And you do see more renewable energy investment like solar energy and wind energy investment in Pakistan. So that's kind of the first puzzle and we will uh, give you more reasons why we think it's puzzling. The second puzzle is about the coal-fired power plants. So what we tend to focus in our research is the technology used by Chinese banked coal-fired power plants. So here is a picture shows the technology of the Chinese banked coal-fired power plants in Indonesia. And we're looking at the different types of tech technology used by the Chinese develop develops. So um, as, we, well, as we know, so some very brief introduction uh, about the technology of the coal-fired power plants. So the, the uh, subcritical technology uh, tend to be the most um, environmental, uh, most environmental damaging in terms of like the energy efficiencies, the cost, you, they have to, you have to put more, basically more coal to generate the same amount of unit of like the electricity. Instead, the supercritical of the ultra supercritical, they tend to be more efficient. So they tend to be more environmentally friendly, so to speak. And if you look at the kind of the distribution of different types of technology in Indonesia, you can see is the, the, the Chinese, um, these project developers, a lot of them tend to use the more, uh, less environmental friendly technology, like subcritical, basically, uh, power plants in Indonesia. And especially if you compare to other foreign investors in the power sector in Indonesia, like the Japanese developers or the Korean developers, they tend to use more advanced ones, okay? And, but that's quite different when it comes to the case of the Pakistan. So here is a picture shows the technology of the coal-fired power plants in Pakistan. Again, we, 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 look in, we, looking, we are looking at the distribution of different types of technology used by these uh, coal-fired power plants developers. And here is quite different from the previous figures. In this case, in, in Pakistan, we see the Chinese project developers, they tend to more likely to use supercritical, that means uh, environmentally more friendly uh, technology compared to their counterparts in Indonesia. So that's become the second puzzle we try to address in our uh, research, okay? So the first puzzle is about renewable energy. The second puzzle is about technology used by these uh, Chinese Coal-fired coal -fired power plants. Okay. The mess, in terms of the methodology we used to answer or to address these two puzzles, we we basically did a lot of like interviews with uh, subjects uh, with these different uh, interview subjects in China, Indonesia, and Pakistan. So these interview subjects include both international and local NGOs, government officials, researchers, and think tank affiliated with uh, different research institutes, journalists, and managers from both the Chinese policy banks and these Chinese overseas power companies. So we try to have these, uh, their different voice from the different countries. The reason we, we we argue that the, the two puzzles, the, 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 the kind of the patterns we observed is puzzling is because the existing theories, they are not sufficient to account for the two patterns we, we just mentioned about. So the first one um, is about the renewable energy. 
from the the common like uh, conventional wisdom in terms of the demand side explanations it's puzzling because if you look at the renewable energy endowment actually indonesia has better wind endowment compared to pakistan but we actually observed pakistan rece received way more investment in wind power compared to the case of indonesia and in terms of the technology of the coal-fired power plants, we know that the, the, the subcritical coal-fired power plants, these are less environmentally friendly uh, power plants, they, but they are, tend to be cheaper from the perspective of, of, of the developers or from the perspective of the recipient country governments. So we know that Pakistan have lower GDP per capita compared to Indonesia. So it seems like it's economically sound or more efficient to have the uh, less environmentally friendly um, technology for the coal-fired power plants. But again, we observe the opposite from the data we just, just show, present to you, you. So that's kind of the, the that's kind of the we, we argue it's puzzling from the deep end side and from the supply side, from the Chinese side. It's also puzzling because back again to kind of the GDP per capita difference between Pakistan and Indonesia, we know that Indonesia have much higher GDP per capita. It seems as a signal to the Chinese investors that the, the Indonesia has more favorable investment climate in terms of the rule of law, governance, etc. And these indicators are usually associated with uh, GDP per capita. And in, and in, in fact, in fact, stakeholders who participate in the renewable energy sectors in Pakistan, we know that in terms of the commercial returns of these renewable energy sect, uh, projects in Pakistan, they are not that promising. So from the perspective of the Chinese side, it seems to be puzzled why the, the Chinese electricity corporations would be uh, willing to investment in Pakistan rather than Indonesia in the first place. Okay, so that's kind of the, the puzzle we try to answer or we, we propose some potential hypothesis. We try to answer these two puzzles. So in terms of a theoretical framework that um, to give a roadmap, the, we, we turn to a new approach, which is uh, we, we call the constellations of interest. So instead of looking at the demand side, the recipient country side or looking at the supply side or the Chinese side, isolatedly, we look at the uh, interaction between both the uh, demand and supply factors. So we're looking at the, the partic project participants from both China and the BI recipient countries. So we're exactly looking at the interaction or interplace between these uh, actors from the both sides, okay? And we argue that there are three specific mechanisms that are quite important to account for the cross-country difference we just talked about. So the first mechanism, the first story is basically about the importance of the incumbent industry, energy industry in the BI recipient countries. Specifically, we're looking at the importance of the coal industry in the BI recipient countries. The second mechanism is about the, de the degree to which the BRI process in the recipient countries is institutionalized or not. So with or not, they are centralized the government agency and they coordinate with each other between the Chinese aging agencies and the recipient country agencies to monitor or enforce certain uh, standards for these uh, Chinese-backed electricity projects. So that's a kind of the second dimension or the second, second story. And the third mechanism is we looking at, uh, we, we will look at the, what we call uh, issue linkage. So that means the potential for the BI recipient countries with or not, they, they can leverage the, um, the geopolitical consideration of the Chinese state to promote the development of renewable energy um, at home. So build the linkage between China's foreign policy goal and the domestic goal of develop, 
development, uh, the, the RE development, so to speak. Okay, so that's kind of our roadmap. We, we, we look at the actors from both China and recipient countries, and we look at the spe specifically the three dynamics, okay, um, the three specific mechanisms. Now let's uh, just give you a um, like preview of our fundings. We found that in Pakistan, the first, the first in terms of the, in, the incumbent industry, we see that the, the absence of the vested interest in, in cow in Pakistan. So that is not a very powerful lobby group for the cow in industry in Pakistan. And the second is we see a more institutionalized BI process in Pakistan compared to the case of Indonesia. And third is we do observe the the, 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 the kind of the existence of the issue linkage in Pakistan. And these three dynamics are quite different from, in Pakistan, is, are quite different from what we observed in the case of Indonesia. So in Indonesia, first we see a very strong kind of power of the interest group, of the, the, the coal-based interest group in Indonesia. And we also observed a less institutionalized BI process in Indonesia. And third, we do not see the strong kind of um, motivation for Indonesian government to link the, uh, the Chinese foreign, foreign policy goal or geopolitical goals to the country's domestic RE sector development. So the, the two countries are quite different in terms of the three mechanism we proposed. Now let's look at the, the cross-country difference in more detail. The first one is uh, about this incumbent industry or about the coal-based uh, interest group. In the case of Pakistan, here is a kind of picture shows uh, uh, the energy mix or technology mix of electricity generation in Pakistan back to about like six years ago. And you see that the cow account for a very, very tiny proportion of the total electricity generation in Pakistan. So there is, uh, the first there is not rich, like the, in terms of the uh, coal endowment in Pakistan. And also they are not a vibrant or very influential, politically influential uh, coal-based interest group in Pakistan. And that's quite different uh, compared to the case of Indonesia. And here is the picture shows, again, shows the portfolio of different types of uh, the uh, sources of, for the electricity generation in Indonesia. I want to draw your attention to the, the blue bar here. It's basically at the bottom, which is the coal-based power generation. And as you see, it's an increasing kind of tendency and basically more and more in terms of the ratio more and more these uh, uh, Indonesia's coal, uh, the power plants uh, tend to use coal uh, for their uh, electricity generation. And there are a lot of evidence from our interview in terms of the political influence of coal power, uh, coal based interest group in Indonesia. And ac actually there are a lot of these, uh, the local coal mining companies, they build the joint ventures with Chinese investment to to kind of extend their business and they start to build more and more coal-fired power plants in the country. Okay, that's kind of the first mechanism. And when we come to another mechanism, which is about the issue linkage, and again, we see the difference between Pakistan and the Indonesia based on our interviews. So in the case of Pakistan, we, what we observed is um, the Pakistan government tend to leverage the, the uh, strategic alliance with the Chinese state um, to advance the domestic uh, development of the RE sector. Uh, one reason is because of their concern about balance of trade. As uh, I, I think as most of you guys here knows that a lot of these electricity generation, to fuel the electricity generation, Pakistan used to have to import a lot of oils or natural gas from other countries and that cost a lot of the foreign exchange resources from, from the Pakistan side. And, and so the Pakistan government think, okay, so maybe developing RE sectors will help the countries to mitigate 
this kind of the imbalance of trade or, or like the exhausted uh, foreign exchange resolves. And they seek the help of the Chinese government. And Chi on the other side of the Chinese government, they think it's a good deal outside, mainly outside of the geopolitical interest of the Chinese leaders. And that actually be confirmed by a lot of our interviews conducted on the ground. So we are more than happy to, 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 to discuss that in the Q&A part. On the other side, um, you do not see that strong linkage between the geopolitical consideration and the, the, the development of IE sector in Indonesia. Instead, what you observe in the case of the Chinese investment in Indonesia is most of these projects are basically occurred at the sub-state level. They tend to be initiated by the project developers. They are usually the Chinese companies or the policy banks for the purpose of more like uh, commercial driven or economic driven reasons instead of um, have something to do with the uh, statecraft or geopolitical goals of the Chinese state. So most of these engagement tend to occur at the sub-state level between the Chinese project developers and local business partner in Indonesia with, without too much uh, involvement of the Chinese central government or Indonesia central government from the, their consideration of geopolitical uh, goals. So that's the second difference. The third difference is in terms of extent to which the BRI process in the recipient country has been institutionalized. And here again, we see a huge difference between Pakistan and Indonesia. And in the case of Pakistan, we observe that there are very strong cross-country coordination between uh, different governments. They, they are like specifically is, uh, established joint cooperation committee with all different, uh, with, with kind of specialized um, staff to kind of enforce or monitoring these uh, different projects. So it's way the, the, in terms of the governance regime, it tend to be more centralized with the budget support and with the involvement of the, of the government from both the Chinese side and the, the, the Pakistani side. But that's quite different in terms of BI process in, in Indonesia. So actually most of these, are uh, uh, based on our interview with the uh, stakeholders, of these power plants in Indonesia, a lot of these projects basically occurred, as we just mentioned, at the sub-state level, usually negotiated between the Indonesia's, Indonesia's local governments and the Chinese firms as kind of exchange uh, for, for like patronage, usually for local governments and local governments approve these projects and then they, they can get the, the, these uh, financial rewarding or the creating more jobs uh, as kind of patronage benefits for the local governments without too much with very, uh, you do not see very strong kind of cross country coordination between Chinese state and the, the, the Indonesian state and you very weakly implemented enforcement of different kind of environmental or social standards. So basically in short, it's a very less institutionalized process in uh, Indonesia. And we can talk more about that in the Q&A if you are curious. So, so that's kind of the three different um, uh, mechanisms account for we, which we talked about in the, in the beginning of the presentation, the two puzzles we try to address because of the issue linkage and because of the absence of the um, coal-based power uh, interest group in Pakistan, you do see the more kind of Chinese investment in the RE sector in Pakistan, which is quite different from the case of Indonesia. And also because of a more institutionalized process in Pakistan compared to Indonesia, you also see that the, um, the environmental standards uh, tend to be more likely to be effectively enforced on the ground compared to the case, relatively speaking, compared to the case of in Indonesia. So the Chinese uh, project developers tend to uh, use more environmentally friendly technology, even if it's maybe not like financially um, sound. Okay, so in terms of to, to come to like bring us to the end of our presentation, I want just want to go back to our theoretical contributions. 
So by proposing this framework, by looking at the both uh, um, the actors in China and actors in recipient countries, we show how the supply and demand factors combine together and interact with each other. And in particular, we show the specific mechanism, the three different mechanisms, the three different kinds of dynamics help us to understand how exactly the actors from China and the BR recipient countries interplay and how these interactions will affect the environmental and or social consequence of the Chinese electricity projects on the ground. Okay, so this brings me to the end of the presentation and um, I'm more than happy to, to, uh, to answer your questions. And thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Liu. That was uh, terrific um, and concise. Um, I will now uh, turn it over to um, uh, Professor Erbelainen, who also um, uh, participated and, and conducted this research. And I, I've asked him to zoom out a little bit and maybe reflect for a few minutes on some of the wider uh, implications of this research and maybe how, how it fits in and, and how it speaks to uh, some of the, the bigger questions about um, uh, about climate change and, and energy mix in, uh, in China's BRI. Excellent. Um, th thank you, uh, Professor White, for the invitation to, to present our research. And uh, thanks, of course, to uh, Dr. Liu for an outstanding, uh, concise presentation. I think the, the most important you know, con context that I need to provide for my remarks is uh, China's uh, President uh, Xi Jinping's uh, announcement that China will stop uh, new coal-fired power generation construction outside uh, Chinese borders. Uh, this is an, a very important announcement because it is the first time that we get a clear high-level signal from China that the game is up for uh, overseas uh, coal finance. And this uh, is, is critical because coal-fired power generation is, is really the primary problem in the power sector. Uh, and it's, it's really the reason why China's previous uh, overseas energy finance has been concerning from a global environmental perspective. Of course, it does change also the um, implications of our research quite a bit, because when we started this research, uh, China was still financing coal-fired power plants. So we wanted to understand why China is financing mostly coal-fired power generation in most countries, but in some countries is also making significant renewable energy investments, as we saw, for example, in the case of Pakistan. And we found these mechanisms from kind of coal incumbent interests to institutionalization, to geopolitics, that can all explain this variation. But what I would like to do in my five minutes of fame is really to think through what this would mean uh, for China's role in the future. The first point is that while we now have this announcement on new coal-fired power generation, the details remain to be determined, TBD. Does that mean any kind of construction? Or does it only mean Chinese directly constructed power plants? Will Chinese banks still be providing financing for coal-fired power plants? Does this mean that plants that are already in the planning stages will be canceled? Or does it mean that it just means there will be no more new plants? There is a number of issues like this that we all need to pay attention to so that we can understand what China's strategy in this area will be going forward. And depending on the answer to that question, I could see the scenario developing in at least two different directions. One, in one scenario, the Chinese commitment turns out to be you know, a lot of talk and less action with many projects moving forward. And in that case, I do think some of these findings on the institutionalization of governance, participation of civil society, and the design of environmental standards will be very important because then the honors for stopping 
coal-fired power generation, the new construction will be mostly with the recipient countries. So in a country like Pakistan, I would keep my eye on things like, is it the case that without uh, new Chinese construction, will there be a change in the direction of energy policy? Or will there be somebody else financing and building uh, these plants? Or is it the case that the Chinese will continue to finance and uh, build, but kind of under the radar? So in that case, we could have this kind of oversight and accountability scenario where a lot hinges on holding the Chinese government accountable uh, for their behavior. On the other hand, if it turns out that China is really moving away from coal in a way that also applies to currently planned uh, plants, maybe simply because the economics are getting less and less favorable every year with competing sources like renewables uh, getting less and less expensive. In that case, the question to me would be, to what extent can we mobilize China's very impressive reach and capacity in financing, capital deployment, construction, to actually build the renewable energy plants that we need. Power demand is not going anywhere, right? So even though COVID-19 has slowed down economies, including Pakistan, we do hope that in the next two to three years, we see a global economic recovery and uh, demand for uh, energy fueled by economic growth uh, will continue. And in that case, then, if China decides to not just kind of reduce its coal financing, but actually redeploy that capital in renewable energy, then we have a unique opportunity. And then the question really becomes, how do we actually maximize China's ability to support these countries? I think it would be a wonderful opportunity for countries like Pakistan, Indonesia, many African countries, if there was a uh, availability of low interest, um, readily accessible, large scale financing for renewables. And in that case, we would then be looking at the same belt and road mechanisms and how to convert them into kind of a powerful force for good, which is promoting clean energy deployment. Finally, uh, Dr. Leo and I wrote earlier uh, for the Brookings Institution a piece that encouraged the United States to kind of challenge uh, China in the field of energy finance by aggressively promoting clean energy finance. Uh, to me, this recommendation still stands. Even if China stops uh, coal finance, even if they follow through with this announcement, we are still going to be in a situation where we absolutely need to accelerate the pace of renewable energy deployment. And in the US policy community, the foreign policy community, the energy community, I think there's a clear need to devise strategies that would also result in this kind of positive sum competition where United States, China, maybe Japan, maybe the Europeans kind of all compete for their ability to finance the clean energy that will in the end be critical for dealing with climate change. So I would say that from our research, we've learned a lot about how the Belt and Road works, the institutional mechanisms, the interests, the ideologies at play, but how to use them will really depend on the direction that China takes. And it can be anything from playing defense to make sure that China follows through, to alternatively promoting a very aggressive global competition on clean energy finance. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to hearing from our colleague uh, from Lahore. Terrific. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I think that was a, a great um, wider perspective on how this research fits into some of the, um, the, the recent news. Um, and uh, what we should be watching for. Um, I'm delighted to, to welcome uh, Dr. Wahid from LUMS to share her thoughts on the research um, and uh, the perspective of what this looks like from, from Pakistan. Um, oh, over to you. Thanks, Josh. Um, I just have a small request. I need a face to talk to. Can I ask you to keep your um, video on if you don't mind? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, 
first of all, thank you very much to SAIS to, for inviting me over. And it was lovely to hear from to you. Um, I love the way he created the entire argument about where this study was coming from. But I'd like to start from where Ioannis actually um, ended. He's talked about, I'm glad he brought that up, the change in the Chinese policy about coal power projects overall. And whether that will bring in any change within the scenario of the way Chinese support is given to renewable energy uh, deployment, and especially uh, in countries like Pakistan, it might actually become much larger. Um, and that creates opportunities for us, obviously. Um, but I'll come to that in a little while, but that, that's, that's an important point I'd like to build up towards. Um, to you mentioned institutional development. Um, initially, when I read the research, I was actually surprised um, about the fact I would have expected Malaysia to have had better institutional uh, setup. Um, but then I realized it, it was he was talking about CPEC correlation uh, coordination. And he, but so apart from the joint cooperation committee, for example, that you, you mentioned, and other mechanisms about liaisoning with the Chinese government and the financial institutions, like the Exim Bank, for example, um, Pakistan's power sector, actually, the energy sector, has undergone tremendous amount of institutional development over the last five to seven years. Um, both uh, Chunu and uh, Chu Yu and Johannes have actually talked to people from the regulator, NEPRA, um, NTDC, the Transmission Dispatch Company, the Alternative Energy Development Board, for example. I'm naming these three because huge amounts of investments, both in infrastructure and human capacity, technical and managerial, has gone into these institutions over the last five years. Most of the funding has come from AD ADB, Asian Development Bank, um, but it came in the backdrop of a far longer term uh, need felt by the state rather than individual political governments um, to make the energy sector work. If you look at various um, research and observations coming out of Pakistan over the last 20 years, uh, the biggest issue was the supply and demand gap. But more importantly was a need for change in the energy mix as well. And that had been felt uh, and planned for since the 1960s, but institutional change um, and institutional maturity has come up throughout the entire setup uh, the, at the systems level in Pakistan. And that has enabled renewables to take hold very quickly. Um, and these institutions have uh, a clear remit, they have clear role, role definitions, um, they have power, they have authority. Um, and they work fairly independently as well. So that has enabled uh, foreign investors and local investors to actually invest readily in renewables. Um, the second thing is that um, I do realize that this current study is limited to solar and wind uh, for comparability, I suppose. But Chuyu started off with um, a slide where he mentioned that Pakistan was the second highest um, uh, the, the country with the second highest investment in power generation. That total figure actually includes hydro as well, and a big chunk of hydro. Um, individual hydro projects, for example, uh, I'm, I'm aware of, I'll just few, I'll just name a few. I do work uh, across the power sector, so I'm aware of dozens. But even if you talk about individual ones, from smaller ones, relatively smaller ones, um, such as the Gomal Zam Dam, which is um, in the, um, what we call FATA, or the tribal areas, um, and the to somewhat larger ones, and we have dozens of them as well, uh, right up to Kachikinari, which is 80 megawatt. Um, that one project alone costs about four, um, two, two, two point two uh, billion US dollars. And nothing uh, across, uh, apart from the coal power, uh, fire, uh, fire power projects, none other uh, renewable energy in terms of solar and wind within Pakistan, if you're talking Chinese, uh, can compete with even a single project. So that's just a caveat over there. Um, but in solar and wind, um, there's lots more happening apart from the Chinese as well. Um, we have a devolutionized uh, government system, wherein uh, provincial governments are taking up uh, projects on their own, hundreds and hundreds of solarization projects, off-grid solarization, um, commercial solarization, 
you name it. So it's public and private. So there's a lot of movement. So what I'm trying to say is um, that the thrust towards renewables and even the ge geopolitical uh, need to actually uh, do this has, um, as an observer, as somebody who sits here, who works with the power sector, um, has been from within rather than from without. If we're talking about Chinese ambitions, um, a clear reflection on the other hand has been Pakistan's ambitions to change its energy mix. Uh, the two projects that I talked about, Gomal Zam and Kachikinari, I brought them in specifically because these had been planned since the 1960s. We just never had the political clout or the deep enough pockets to make them. Chinese investment allows us to do that. It allows the government to actually invest. And yes, um, it brings in different challenges as well, um, because um, this is the first time this, this amount of South-South uh, funding has actually happened for this country. Um, traditionally, we've had Western, so-called Western, we even call JICA Western uh, for some reason, uh, the Japanese. So, so we're talking Asia Development Bank, we're talking World Bank, we're talking funding from USAID, GIZ. Uh, GIZ normally helps uh, um, with technical proposals. And then JICA. All of these have been, if I might say, an entirely different beast to deal with. The requirements for reporting, for evaluation have been very stringent. And that works for emerging countries such as Pakistan, whose, while I said the institutions for governing uh, energy are very strong, the capacity to actually design, create and deliver projects, especially mega projects, is institutionally very weak in the country. That might seem contradictory, it's not, it's not. And when that, when, and when South-South funding such as from China comes to, um, well, financially, you know, finance hungry country, so to say, uh, like Pakistan, um, who, who, who really, really desperately wants to invest in infrastructure and uh, power and, and industry, and you don't have the capacity to deliver, um, poor evaluation and monitoring mechanisms, it brings in a lot of different difficulties because these are all loans. When ADB and World Bank um, give loans to the country, they're very stringent about what reporting happens, what happens on the ground. Uh, there's a lot of answerability happening. With Chinese investment, um, it is more about um, and Chu, you would know more about this, uh, and probably Johannes as well. There's an element of trust, uh, generally, that the recipient country um, knows best how to utilize those funds. So there is lesser oversight. And that means, that's what I meant when I say that's a very different piece. This, and this amount of South-South funding. So that, that is a big challenge for countries like well, Indonesia and Pakistan and Brazil and, and all of the big recipients. Um, also, um, the geopolitical thrust that I mentioned slightly earlier on. Um, I hope I'm not taking too much time, Josh. I can continue. Yeah, just a, a few more minutes is fine. A few minutes, okay. Um, the geopolitical thrust actually is coming from within as well. Um, I've worked within the Karek region, which is Central Asia and China and Pakistan. Um, and Pakistan has for a considerable amount of time seen huge potential in actually being able to link to Central Asia, which is uh, landlocked. Um, so, so in terms of ambitions for hydropower projects, for renewables, a better energy mix, so to say, um, as well as investing in infrastructure, not just power, uh, CPEC and BRI means a lot of things for the country. The ambitions are coming from within. And so, um, so coming back to what Johannes said, um, in the absence of coal, while um, funding is likely to become bigger for renewable energy for countries such as Pakistan, huge opportunity, I would gather that the country would be hungry for more. So there's a very clear demand side for this as well. Um, so, so just my observation that care is needed 
because there are some really big institutional voids uh, in the country, uh, despite great institutional development within the power center. Terrific. Um, thank you for those, those comments. I think that sheds light on the institutional dimension of this research and, and how to think about um, those institutional uh, variables. Uh, yep, go ahead. Could I add just one more thing? I noted that. Oh, please. Gone. Chu, you mentioned that Pakistan is not cold endowed. It is. It just hasn't been explored too much. There are huge uh, reserves in the Thar region, uh, in South and Sindh, and they are being explored now. Um, so, so that that just wanted to correct that. And there's there's the technology dimension to being able to to uh, to explore those. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So when you're talking about coal interests, they have not existed before locally, indigenously, because those reserves had not been explored. They are likely to raise their heads up now. Great. Uh, this is this has been great. I'd like to move to Q and A. Uh, so if you have questions, some of you have already put some terrific questions in the Q and A box. Um, uh, I would like uh, the panelists to, to turn their, their videos on uh, and I will start off with just a, a couple of questions that came to my mind as I listened to this presentation, uh, these presentations to get us going. Um, and any of you can, can uh, address these as you, as you see fit. Um, the, and I really have two questions. The first is, you know, to, to what extent in doing this research did you think about or consider how the 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 mix of investments um, was responsive to uh, perceived requirements that went beyond simply generation. So the uh, requirements of of the grid or the existing uh, transmission and distribution infrastructure or the need for for base load power. Um, that is sometimes more challenging with renewable generation. Um, so that kind of demand side. Uh, consideration from the, the recipient countries. Uh, and the second is, is a bigger picture, more global question. Um, you know, it's, it's unclear uh, when Pakistan will ha uh, have a demand uh, for uh, uh, sort of another wave of large scale investment in, in generation. But if we look at some of these other countries that were on that ranked list of those that are engaging with China for energy investment, um, are there other countries where you think we're likely to see this research be, a, be applicable in terms of helping us to understand the, the possible determinants of whether Chinese investment ends up being more or less environmentally friendly, um, uh, either more environmentally uh, friendly um, in, uh, with, uh, with coal, if, if that continues to happen, or uh, more likely with other renewables. So I want to begin with those two questions, then we'll turn to some of the, the participant questions uh, in the Q&A. I can say a few words about the first one. Um, so I, I think there's two dimensions that we need to consider here. The, the first one is that both Pakistan and Indonesia when the, the kind of Chinese energy finance tribe started. They started from a very low level of renewable energy or variable power generation. And so as a result, at least for the initial projects, I think considerations like uh, kind of base load or the load curve, um, I think they're less important. These would be issues that you do face at some point, right? So if you really scale up, and we're starting to see this in India, for example, now where they've made significant investments. But I, I don't think at this stage uh, for those two countries, this would yet be uh, a significant uh, concern. So, so I, I think at that point, it was still a sim kind of a simple, in, in some sense, a simple question of, so we need more electricity and where can we find it at a reasonable cost and, yeah. uh, and, and security. Uh, thank you so much, Josh, for, for your question. So I want to add some like thoughts, um, random, random thoughts, initial thoughts about your second question. So in terms of the extent to which our um, argument can be generalized to other BRI countries, I think that Pakistan is definitely a very unique case because uh, CPAC is a flagship, a, a kind of part of the BRI. 
And so um, I think the, in terms of both the geopolitical importance of Pakistan and also the extent to which the BI process have been uh, institutionalized in Pakistan is quite different from the dynamics in other uh, BI countries. But I think uh, based on our interview um, on the ground, the uh, CPAC is, uh, mm, the Chinese actor learn a lot from their uh, experience in the CPAC Be, um, because they, it's, not, it's not something uh, the Chinese project developer used to do before. And it seems to me, at least it's a learning curve there. So potentially if they think that the both the institutionalization of the trans, transnational coordination um, is come, have some like positive benefits um, in the long run and they might um, replicate or apply that kind of uh, institution building uh, in the future for other BI countries um, it, as long as they think it, it's like kind of beneficial for the Chinese side. So that's kind of what I heard during my interview, um, but uh, these, uh, these are not have been occurred yet. Yeah. Great. Is there anything you want to add, uh, Zero, to those comments before we dive into the other questions? I think we can go for the next question. Okay, Thank great. You. Um, uh, maybe particularly for, uh, for uh, Chu Yu and, and Johannes, there was a question about uh, uh, really sort of the, the cost basis of these different fuel types. And the question was, have you done cost comparisons between the fuel types in both countries? So the sort of the more uh, microeconomic drivers that may have uh, shaped the, the choices um, by these countries, recognizing that, that, that uh, particularly in renewables, that that's been quite dynamic over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, but how did, how did you factor those cost calculations into the, the country's decision making? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. I think ideally we do want to have these kind of uh, macro level evidence to directly speak to our arguments. But the difficulties I think have, have, have we, we cannot do that in our research. It has have something to do with two factors. The first is the, uh, the heterogeneity within um, both Pakistan and Indonesia. So they, these projects are basically implemented or conducted by all different Chinese companies and they come into the recipient country market with quite different uh, kind of profile of their capital, technology and experience. So it's very hard for us to uh, kind of get a conclusion which can be applied to uh, all these quite different uh, pro project developers. So that's kind of the first uh, answer. That's the reason we, 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 it's very hard for us to do that. The second is, uh, second factor is also relevant to the first one is because we need kind of uh, the company level or project, project level data. And usually these have, uh, are not publicly available because they are, they have something to do with business secret. So when we ask that, the, the, actually these uh, interview subjects are very hesitant to, to, to give us detailed answer in terms of like the, the even the, the tariff, specific tariff arrangement uh, between the plants and the uh, uh, transmission um, grid. So, so it's very hard to, to get the micro level evidence directly, which is unfortunate. So, so to add to that, I, I do think we can, uh, at the macro level, uh, share a few comments. So if you go back to the early years of this Chinese energy finance, there would be a very significant cost gap in favor of uh, conventional thermal power generation, both in Indonesia and Pakistan. So if you look at some of these projects in 2013, for example, there wouldn't be any economic basis for renewables. Um, that said, one thing that we have seen in many countries, um, uh, beginning with India and Vietnam in, in, in the region, uh, and I think now already happening both in Pakistan and Indonesia is that both over time and as your experience with renewables improves, you can really drive down the cost very quickly. Uh, and uh, we, we are starting to see that now that we have projects coming online, the cost of renewables is quickly first sort of meeting the cost of coal-fired power generation and then uh, improving over time. I think Pakistan has in many ways got better fundamentals for renewables because there's more land available, the, the, uh, the insulation, especially for solar is quite good. Um, but in both countries, there is opportunity. And so I think one way to think about these projects is really that at least 
until in the past two or three years, you were kind of making a bet in, okay, we are going to get started with the energy transition and you would accept a, a certain cost. Now, the one issue that's, of course, coming up in, in a few years is going to be the issue that uh, Professor White mentioned, which is uh, the intermittency management, grid stability and all that. But we are not quite there just yet. Thanks. Uh, there was a there was a question, uh, a couple of questions related to, to Pakistan in particular. Uh, one, the the gist I think is uh, how clean are the uh, clean coal uh, plants in Pakistan? I think that's been a question that's come up a number of times. It's been hard to get uh, fidelity on. Uh, and the other, uh, you know, as I as I read it, is you know, to what extent is there a uh, political or institutional constituency for renewables emerging in Pakistan, um, and you know what is sort of the the political or the political economy basis of that constituency. What what is that? You know, is that driven from a sort of a, a high political sense that Pakistan wants to meet its sustainable development goals? Is it driven by certain investment uh, lobbies or constituencies that see better return on investment? Um, what does that seem? look like? Uh, and I welcome any, any of your thoughts on that. So let, let me comment on the uh, clean coal aspect. I, I think it depends on which dimension of clean we are talking about. So if we're talking about climate change and global warming, greenhouse gas emissions, I don't think they're clean at all. The fact that they're a little more efficient than the old plants doesn't really solve the problem. They are still very, very polluting from a climate change perspective. Um, where I do think uh, there's been progress is on the air pollution side. So the, the Pakistani plants would typically use Chinese technology because China is the, uh, the, the kind of primary uh, financier and constructor. And uh, we, we do see in China that sulfur emissions, PM2.5 emissions are very low now with the latest technology. There is still uh, the, uh, NOx, so nitrogen oxide emissions, is still a significant issue. So they are not clean, like it's not just hot air coming out of the pipe, but they are quite clean. And so, so there's been significant improvement. And Professor White, you might remember when we visited Pakistan with our students, we had one presentation where they showed some of the statistics and the numbers were comparable with natural gas plants in one of the newer coal-fired power plants. So that, that is overall, I think, reasonably impressive. It reminds me of the conversations I have when I when I tell my children that they need to take a shower because they're they're dirty, and they say, "Well, you know, it's uh, you can't see the, you can't see the dirt." So maybe maybe tomorrow or maybe next week. Um, is that right? You wanted to jump in. Um, couldn't agree more. Um, sorry, I'm on mute. Okay. Yeah, no. uh, couldn't agree more with Johannes. No. Um, how clean is coal? Coal is never clean. Um, video. Coal is never clean. It's, it's just comparative. But if we go back to the uh, to the mix that Chuyu had shown earlier on, Chuyu, can, can we move back to Pakistan, the energy mix, if you don't mind? Um, sure, uh, let me just share my, my screen again. Um, yes. Um, is, the, is the technology one or is the like- No, the pie chart which was showing the energy mix. Oh, okay, okay, got it. Um, it had a very, very thin pie for coal. This one, right? This, this one? one, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, so in answer to um, the new Chinese technology for um, coal-powered uh, projects, um, for example, the Sahival one, uh, which is in southern Punjab, um, it is far, far cleaner. And like uh, Johanna said, it's almost as good as natural gas. So the way the pie is currently increasing at the moment, coal is, uh, that, that minute chunk that is coal is going to remain that way. What is changing is natural gas is actually shrinking low. It's becoming smaller, um, as is oil. What is increasing is hydro. What is increasing is that missing chunk, which is um, wind and solar, which is negligible enough. Not um, The data is 2014. It begins to appear from 2017, 18 onwards. It's still less than 4%, but it shows on the pie. But the way the pie is increasing, it's also nuclear. Um, 
In fact, this year or early 2002, 2022, there's about 2.2 gigawatt of nuclear coming online. Nuclear is clean. Nuclear, uh, for, I call it clean. Uh, nuclear is clean. Uh, nuclear is inexpensive. Um, so the so the way the the pie is changing, coal will never be clean. Um, but it's a very small part of the pie, the way it is, it is emerging right now. And you will see shifts in a far more cleaner, um, you know, shift. So um, that's my answer. Coal is never clean. That's great. I think that gives us a, a good uh, dynamic picture of how that mix is, is changing and when, what to expect. Do you, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I just want to speak a few words about the case of Indonesia is because when we collect the data, the project level kind of data about in the, when we do the, 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 the kind of the cross country difference between Indonesia and Pakistan. So one thing interesting about Indonesia is uh, first, it's very way less transparent compared to uh, like the, the technology type. So it's very, more, much more easier for you to know which types of technology have been used for these Chinese banked uh, coal-fired power plants in Pakistan than their counterparts in Indonesia. It's very, very difficult to verify the, the, in the case of Indonesia. And also in our interview, a lot of like rumors basically about this, you never really know what kind of like technology be used for these coal-fired power plants in Indonesia. But uh, that's, that's quite different compared to our experience when it comes to Pakistan. So I think that's consistent with also, uh, Zara also mentioned about the recent institutional development of the Pakistan's power sector. So I think that that has something to do with that because I, I was more impressed by the transparency and the professionalism in the uh, power sector for these regulators in Pakistan compared to the case of Indonesia, yeah. Great. Um, a couple of questions uh, from, from the chat I'd like to, uh, to put on the table. One was about um, to what extent you consider uh, overall, overall endowments, uh, coal endowments, size, quality, and exploitability in Indonesia, and the likelihood that that's more favorable in Indonesia than in Pakistan. As Zara mentioned, Pakistan has coal endowments, but they, uh, they haven't been exploited for uh, probably for some technical and political reasons and, and maybe um, overall other cost considerations. Uh, so th that question on endowments. And, and then there's a, there's a question about, uh, which I take to be about financing uh, costs uh, and a comparison between Chinese uh, and, and Western uh, investments in the energy sector. In, in Pakistan. And Zara, as you mentioned, maybe we can include the, the Japanese in that latter category, um, with the, or, or maybe not. The, the perception that uh, the cost of doing business with China is uh, considerably lower than it is um, doing business with uh, uh, Western uh, financiers or the Japanese. Um, what do you make of that? Um, and to what extent is, is the, are the data on that uh, um, open or transparent? Um, and are we, seeing, are we seeing more hard data than we, than we were seeing five or 10 years ago to be able to make those kind of comparisons? So first on, first on coal endowments and, and secondly on sort of the, the, what we know about the cost of financing. Should you maybe begin with your thoughts on these? Yeah, um, so I think in terms of the case of Pakistan, we, for the Chinese-backed uh, coal-fired power plants, we see two types of like uh, coal power plants. So the first type is the you see uh, the, the, the quality are not good enough. Uh, these like low quality, relatively low co quality calls from um, ta um, Tao, I think. And also you see uh, another different types of uh, coal fired power plants you use the uh, imported coal, which is usually from uh, Indonesia or Australia, uh, which have better quality. Um, so I think that's kind of the, uh, when, when, when we talk about the coal endowment, uh, we, we may want to um, address these two different types of the uh, coal fired power plants in, in, in Pakistan. Um, and we observed the better technology be used for those power plants use uh, imported coal 
um, because of the, the, the kind of like super critical power plants, they, they have some specific requirement for the quality of the call. So it will not be like the um, good idea for these uh, super critical or even better ones to use um, the call from Tao. So that's the reason you, you see this kind of within country difference here. Um, yeah, for the, the case of Indonesia, and I think even with very rich coal resources, uh, so theoretically speaking, uh, you can use uh, better technology. Um, but uh, for the Chinese project, most of them still use uh, subcritical uh, ones based on the data we have. Uh, and, and it's also different from the case of uh, Korean de uh, developers and Japanese developers in Indonesia. Johannes, maybe, maybe you want to say something about that. Yeah, let me follow up on this. I, I think it's a great question. And, and certainly, coal endowments in, in general, obviously, have a lot of predictive power when it comes to which countries are using coal power. That, that is a, a fairly kind of obvious uh, and powerful uh, predictor. Uh, that said, again, I, I, I would still say that there is still something something kind of interesting uh, about uh, a country like Indonesia, which is generally a kind of a, you know, it, it's, a, it's an economic success story. It's a democratic country. Uh, it has an air pollution problem. The fact that there is sort of so little effort to diversify the energy mix and just, if, if nothing else, just to hedge against the kind of a different future it's, it's still interesting, right? Because we see in India, another coal-rich country, not high quality coal, but a lot of domestic coal. Uh, we see both, uh, for the longest time, both coal and renewables growing. We see in the United States, uh, the transition away from coal began despite very kind of uh, good and uh, abundant coal resources. So uh, I think the resource endowment mechanism goes a long way. It's a powerful explanation, but, um, I, I think you still need to look at some of these other considerations to understand why so little has been done in the case of, uh, of Indonesia. If, if Indonesia had that kind of designed a renewable energy program and started kind of uh, investing in it aggressively, uh, requesting Chinese financing while continuing to build the coal fleet, I think there would be less of a puzzle uh, to study. Great, then. Uh... Uh, Zara, on, on, on that question, but any, any observations about the cost of financing and how, how that is uh, uh, you know, perceived and what you, think, what you think the realities are? My point was actually less about the cost of financing. It was more to do with the ability of the country to actually um, discipline uh, the, the institutions um, to actually discipline themselves when it comes to spending that money in the absence of their capacity to deliver mega projects on their own. Um, so yes, it's, it's easier money in terms of inflows. While at one point in time, for example, uh, the government was, um, well, I won't get specific examples, but it's, it's, it's easier because of, our geo, of Pakistan and China's um, geopolitical relations. Um, but my point was less about cost. It was more about understanding that those huge amounts of debts have to be repaid. And if they are not judiciously um, invested into projects um, and delays in projects uh, going over costs, it's happening uh, more frequently than it should. Um, that is a, co a cause for concern when it comes to CPEC related energy mega projects. Um, I'm talking about the ones in which uh, the local institutions are involved in developing and uh, well, later on operating the projects. It's less of a concern when you have turnkey contra contracts. Um, whenever you have EPC contracts, they usually are won by, the, uh, by Chinese contractors and their entire supply chains are coming uh, very, very well established, very efficient supply chains. Um, so those are in safe hands. But when it comes to uh, the capacity of public institutions to um, develop projects out of the funding that is coming, and that is long-term debt, but it's debt nonetheless. So compared to north-south transfers, where there's, there's a lot of checks and balances in place, there are fewer checks and balances in place when you're talking about south-south funding coming from China. So. It's, it's less about costs, it's, it's more about understanding the implications in the longer run. Um, yeah. 
and, and those longer run impl success. implications are longer run costs uh, that will have to be yes. borne by, uh, by, yes. by governments and by consumers um, and by, by children who have to, who should be able to breathe clean air among other things. Um, this has been, this has been really fascinating. Uh, I have learned a lot. It's not my core area of expertise, but I'm delighted to be able to, uh, to partner with Johannes to bring some of this research to light. Um, and, um, we hope that all of those who have listened have enjoyed it and we'll be distributing this, uh, this widely. We look forward to, to seeing this uh, work published as well, but let me thank, uh, uh Dr. Liu, Dr. Erpelainen, um, and Dr. Wahid for, uh, for a really uh, interesting conversation and one that I think is, uh, you know, only more relevant and important in some ways um, in light of uh, China's changing posture toward, toward coal investment. So uh, we look forward to seeing future iterations of this research and thinking about it uh, more broadly in a global context. Um, but thank you from Johns Hopkins SICE, uh, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, everybody. This is fantastic. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Bye.